Welcome to Chicago, the Windy City, the city of deep dish pizza, Italian beef sandwiches, and some of the most iconic skyscrapers and architecture in the United States, which is what we'll be focusing on in this trip. We begin our tour at the River Walk with the Shoreline Sightseeing Group. Tickets for the architecture tour are around $50 for adults and $28 for children. With tickets in hand, follow the signs and head downstairs right next to the Apple Store on Michigan Avenue. Shoreline has staff around who will guide you and help answer any questions you may have. Once your ticket is scanned, head down to the boat and get ready to enjoy the tour. There are alcoholic and non-alcoholic drinks available for purchase on the boat. You know what to do. Hit that subscribe button, like this video, and get notified when new videos drop. Don't forget to leave a comment below. Thank you. This is a 75-minute guided boat tour that takes you through a quick trip around the three branches of the Chicago River. Let's go. According to the rider to the north was 1924. The Wrigley Corporation, Wrigley Gum, Wrigley Candy, and of course, Wrigley Field. It's all the same there. This is a Spanish revivalist style of architecture. In the early 1900s, in the early 1920s, the United States had not yet come up with its own style of architecture. 
So we had to copy from Europe. That clock tower is actually a copy from a cathedral in Seville, Spain. 250,000 terracotta white tiles down the sides of that building, a design by a gentleman named Mr. Charles Beerman. Being a Wrigley Field, what's the most important guy in the ball game? The beer man, that's how you remember. All right, folks, look up, look high, get that camera up. The second tallest building in the city of Chicago, Trump International Hotel and Tower. It joined the riverfront around 2009. Tops out at 1,389 feet high. It's a creation of Mr. Adrian Smith. Mr. Smith is billed as the world's tallest architect, a Chicago guy, five foot eight, to five foot eight inches tall. This is a contextualism style of architecture. Contextualism means it's designed to blend in and complement its surroundings. Trump Tower does that by the first level of, or look at the different roof levels. The first level of roof matches that of the Wrigley building next door. Let your eyes continue on up to the second rooftop, then you come across and it matches the height of the Mathers Tower. That's that tall skinny piece right there sticking up. And then if we go up to the third level, it matches that of the black box building coming into our view now. The other attempt that was made here is with the gray as an attempt to pull the white of the Wrigley to the black of the AMA building, the blue to reflect the water. A contextualism style of architecture, if you moved it from its location, it would not fit anywhere else because it was designed for that area. Since doing, um, since doing the Trump Tower at 1,389 feet, the Burj Khalifa in Dubai was a project of Mr. Smith's, topping out at 2,700 feet. And he's working on a tower in Japan that will be over 3,200 feet, about one kilometer high. There you go. Back to the business at hand. Have your cameras up and have them ready. Off to your right and watch the two of me will be the four famous towers of Marine City. Probably the most photographed towers in the city of Chicago. This is a project of Mr. Bertrand Goldberg. He was a Chicago guy, studied over in Europe in his youth. While in Europe, he discovered that people actually lived downtown Chicago, and this was I mean, downtown in the cities, and that was in the early 60s. That was not really happening here in Chicago yet. So Mr. Goldberg came back and came up with this creation. Mr. Goldberg said there are no straight lines and no 45 degree angles in nature, so he did not put them into his designs. Marina City is a residential building, so to make them sort of, so people could actually live in it, they needed all the amenities, such as dry cleaners, stores, movie theaters, restaurants, just to name a few. While you're at it, why not just go ahead and put a boat harbor at the bottom? You could even include a restaurant above. I mean, you gotta park your car somewhere, so why not have circular valet parking? And why not just go ahead and live in a pie-shaped apartment in the sky? This building has the absolute best balcony. Some of the units have two balconies each, so awesome views in there. So it's still a very active condominium building today. Off to our left over here, we're going along the part of the city known as the Loop. The Loop is the downtown central business district for the city. It gets the name the Loop because the elevated train comes in, circles the perimeter of the downtown, and takes the people back out. Well, I have your attention over here to your left. I don't want you to miss out on this white, this white granite-based building. Look at the base of the building, and then let your eyes follow those columns up to the top, to the Parthenon-style roof up there. This is a neoclassical design of architecture. That is, it's a copy of an old design of architecture, a Roman architecture, but it's built with modern-day materials, granite, glass, metal. Mr. Ricardo Gofil, our only international architect on the tour today, from 1993. Over your right is RPM. Just a fun place to hang out, have a great dinner, hang out with some really cool people. As we pass under the Clark Street Bridge, this is one of the 37 trunnion bass fuel bridges in the city of Chicago. Chicago has 37, which is second only to Amsterdam, who has 61. Off to your right is the Reed Murdoch building, a grocery warehouse when it was originally completed in the 1900s. Today serves as an office building, but in a re and of course, restaurant in there. But look at that clock tower at the top. A feature of this clock tower is that it appears to sit in the center of the building, but it, it does not. 
If you count the window bays on the right, you'll find there's six of them. But if you go to the left and count one, two, three, four, five, there's only five. That's because in 1930, they had to widen LaSalle Street. So to do that, they had to lop off the end of the building. They reconstructed it so you can hardly tell the clock tower is off center. Now look at this tall green glass structure off to your right. That's 300 North LaSalle, 2009. This is one of our most green energy efficient buildings in the city. But what I really like to point out about it is if you've seen the movie Transformer Dark of the Moon, if not, you'll want to see it when you leave, when you get back home. This is the building that just falls down. Okay, it just falls over as it's standing. The main characters go sliding down the outside of the building. She did it with her hair, makeup, and heels. and never messed anything up. One of the eco-friendly features of this building is that the um, cooling system, generally the buildings are cooled by cold water that's chilled at the top and tanks of water at the top. Instead, this building takes cold water from the river, pumps it into the cooling system, and then returns it back to the river. There's only one problem with that, is every once in a while a fish comes flying through the ventilation system, but other than that, it's all good. We're passing under the Well Street Bridge. This is actually a replica of the bridge from the early 1900s. 2013, they built this new bridge off-site in section, floated in and mounted it a couple, in a series of a couple uh, weekends. Over here on our right, let's look at the Merchandise Mart, the one and the only, the world's largest office building when it was completed at the end of 1929. This is Art Deco. This is Americana. Okay, this is our first of our style of architecture. Indiana limestone on the sides of the building, recessed windows that create columns that take your eyes to the top, setbacks on the roof, and generally you'll see a repeat pattern. That's called a machine stamp um, up above as well. When you see this style of architecture, that's 1925 to 1930, all right? And I'll tell you later why 1930 was so important, but you'll always know that was the era it was built. Marshall Fields built it. Marshall Fields was the major retailers, uh, one of the major retailers in the city of Chicago back in its day. Those posts with the heads on them are actually the bust of other famous retailers, Sears Roebuck, Montgomery Wards, Eileen's, just to name a few. Rumor has it Jeff Bezos' ex-wife was about to put his head on one of those posts not so long ago. We just sailed into Wolf Point. Wolf Point is where the city began. In the first fur trading, hotels, etc. Today it's a collection of all glass buildings. Anyway, on your left over here, you see this green building with the curve. This is contextualism at its best. The New Bean Center. Remember I said contextualism complements its surroundings. Well, this building does it because when you see the bend of the building matches the bend of the river. This is where the river turns to go south. If you've seen the movie Ferris Bueller's Day Off, this is the building where his dad worked, right? Now, if you look straight ahead, you see the River Point building. The River Point building here, do you notice that arch structure? That arch is very important because it looks decorative, but it's really part of the structure. That is how they got around and had to straddle the railroad that's underneath. There's actually an active railway still working underneath of there. Now, because that arch and the arch design at the top, some people say that looks like a McDonald's apple pie box or a hot pocket. Man, wouldn't you be upset if you were an architect, somebody compared you to a McDonald's box. <laughs> anyway. That concrete wall you see there is what's hiding the railroad and what looks like just decorative cutouts or not. Those are actually fans ventilating the exhaust from the train underneath. Now, that short little building off to the side, that's Gibson's Italian. Oh, good stuff, folks. Great Italian steakhouse. Um, the only thing that makes it better is if somebody else picks up the tab because it is quite pricey. <laughs> Anyway, let's look at the Fulton House that's standing there before us, that reddish one in color. Now, when this was built in 1898, that's the oldest building on our tour today, it was not built as a residential building that it is today. It was actually a cold storage house. There was lots of stockyards around here, so when they'd slaughter the meat, they had to store it somewhere. They would bring down big chunks of ice from up north, float them down on barges, and put it into that building, which kept it cool. In 1971, when they shut that building down, it took three months for that building to fall out. And that's because the walls were four feet thick, full of horsehair and cork. Okay? Mr. Harry Weiss, he's the one that gets credit 
for um, converting that into condominiums in 1981. I mentioned the trunnion bascule bridges. What that means, those bridges lift up from the middle to the outside. There's a big counterweight hidden in the bridge houses on each of the banks of the river on the opposite ends that are counterbalanced to move that weight of that metal structure. It takes about a 110 horsepower motor to move those bridges. That's about the size of a, hunt of a um, Toyota Corolla motor. Okay? This is the Carroll Street Bridge from 1908, and it's still an active bridge, believe it or not. Union Pacific, once a year, drops the bridge down, drives a truck across, puts it back up, just like so keep title to the bridge. On our left over here, though, now look at this funky little design. These are the river cottages. This was 1988. This is Mr. Harry Weiss once again. He's the guy that did the building next door and converted it. Mr. Weiss was a guy who had, he was a, he was a fan of sailing and nautical. So he put his personality in the building. Notice the triangles and the circles. The other thing that he did is when he built this structure, he built it with the front facing the river. That was a game changer because up until then, all the buildings backs faced the river. Over here on our right is the East Bank Club. If you're into working out, this is the one and only gym in the whole country. It's nothing like it. But anyway, when it was built in 1980, it was built with its back to the river. It did not have a river walk. It did not have all the windows that it has today. The back of the building faced the river. If they could do it over, they'd switch it around for sure. Over here on our left is Kinsey Park. Kinsey Park came about in 2001. Before they broke ground, they sold 400 units. It's a combination of condominiums, townhomes, and even apartments. Now today, if you want to live on this river that once was neglected, one of those townhomes there will cost you about $2 million. Okay? That's also a really cool development because once you drive inside, through the gates, you no longer know you're in the city. It just looks like a neighborhood. Really cool. All right, folks, we're going to make a U-turn here. While we make that U-turn, I'm going to jump off the mic for just a couple minutes. Zach is still down there. If you need a refill on your drink or your beverages, the restrooms are down there. Um, if I answer any quick questions, I'll do that. Otherwise, I'll be back in just a couple minutes. While the top deck provides beautiful views of the city, the lower deck of the boat is air conditioned throughout the tour in case you need it. Our shops, very neighborhoodish, very all the locals. Oprah Winfrey's studios used to be over there, Harpo Studios. She sold that property to the McDonald's Corporation and they built their world headquarters there. So if you want to take the kids over to a McDonald's, go there because that restaurant in that building has food that you'd only find like in Great Britain or in Tokyo. So they have some international flavors and they rotate that menu. So just a little fun thing to do there. As we make our, uh, just follow the Randolph Street Bridge over Randolph Street West, you'll run right into it. As we make our way under the Randolph Street Bridge, I want you to be ready to look up over here on your left. This is the Bank of America building, just completed out in 2020. It is our newest all-commercial building. A couple features of this building. Notice how they what they did for the river setback. They set back the building 30 feet. They went up three stories, but then they came back over and recaptured it and used that tri-column pier system to support that building to maximize that, that floor space. Another feature of this building that I like is even like on a day like today when the sun hits that just right with the sky behind it, this building all but disappears due to the color scheme of the, of the mirrored glass. Another feature when you build such a building, I live just on the other side and I have a west view. 
Well, I used to only get west sun when the sun set in the evening. Now I get morning and night sun because the morning sun comes up, shines on the building, and reflects back into my living room. So anyway, this building, $800 million to build it. In 2020, they sold it last year for $1.2 billion. $300 million return in two years. Good real estate going on here for us. All right, folks, let's talk about styles of architecture. We'll put them into a chronological order. Coming up over here on your left, this is to North Riverside. If you remember when we started the tour, I talked about the Wrigley Building and Spanish Revival as a copy of Europe. By the mid-1920s, we came up with Art Deco. This is what was on the merchandise mark. Limestone, recessed windows, setbacks of the room. Okay? Whenever you see this, this is 1925 and 1930. This was the Jazz Age. This was the Roaring Twenties. This is when America was really booming and growing, and we need a lot of these large buildings. October the 29th, 1929, the stock market crashed and the Great Depression set in. Because of that, by 1930, there was no need for these large office buildings. The economy just didn't justify it. The last large office building to be completed in the United States after the stock market crash was the Empire State Building in New York. It wasn't until the later 1950s, after World War II had ended, we, the economy was starting to return and become robust again. We were building our infrastructure and they needed large buildings. And that's where we come up with these two buildings. We call this Gateway Plaza 1 and Gateway Plaza 2. This style of architecture is called black box modernism. A gentleman named Ludwig Mies van Bero, a guy from Germany, immigrated here during the war, set up shop and became um, the architect of the century. Notice the simplicity of these buildings. The simplicity of the buildings being it's metal, it's glass, it's straight lines. There's no frills, no ornamentation, no gargoyles hanging off the side of it. Just basic structure. You have to keep in mind the people who were building and buying these buildings. That period of time, they were all post-depression era babies. They did not waste. So do not waste anything. It was all about function over form. A feature of this style of architecture, whenever you see it, is always look around because it'll have a nice plaza. And generally on the plaza, there will be a nice piece of artwork because the inside of the building was about work, the outside was where you would go to relax and enjoy. So that was black box modernism. Now coming up on your right is Gateway Plaza 3. That's this white building. And this is the early 70s. Look how crazy they got. Yeah, what's so different is the square building, straight lines. Yeah, they put a facade on it. Give them a little break, okay? So they're starting to loosen up a little bit. We call this an international style of architect. And you see it all over the United States and throughout the world. It wasn't until the 80 when th 80s when things really started getting crazy. Now, the 80s is where people were breaking out a little bit more, making their own personal statement. It was all about being big and flashy. Women had great big hair, shoulder pads, whatever. Well, that's where we come up with Gateway Plaza 4. That's this green building. Okay, so now you have a color in a glass. You've got shiny glass. You've got curved glass. You've got curved walls. I mean, they are going nuts. And this is the start of contextualism. What was really happening is there was advancements in metal and glass technology that permitted such things. And this is what led into contextualism, into contemporary. You don't want to call it modern. There's all kinds of new words being used. But anyway, that was the lead. Now, if you've been to Millennium Park or if you get to Millennium Park, look at the amphitheater. I'm trying to describe that. It's beautiful, but I don't know what you'd really describe it as. Um, so it's just a cool feature or a cool structure. Over here on your left, as we make under the bridge, if you own a black box modernism building and you feel you need to update, here's a simple trick you can do. Just put an $8 million facade on the front of your building. This is an exact replica of the city street map of Chicago. And that red marker up there is where we are right now. We call this the You Are Here building, okay? So all they did is the new owners, when they bought it 10 years or so ago, they put that facade up there just to make a difference. Now, 
Okay, but any Batman fans on board? Who likes Batman movies? If you do, over here on your right is Gotham Bank. Yes, Gotham Bank. This is Van Buren Street that you're about to pass under. That's where the Joker got away with the most load of money. It's also known as the old post office from about 1921. It was the country's largest post office when completed. We needed such a large post office because we were such a retail, a catalog retail giant in the early 1900s. Catalog shopping is what Amazon is today. You couldn't buy it locally, you ordered it and had it shipped. We had Sears, Filene's, Marshall Fields, and others. Well, when that business dried up and went away, nobody needed a post office quite that size anymore. So they ended up abandoning it, and it sat empty for many, many years. About nine years ago, about $800 million ago, 2 million square feet of that floor space was renovated and now is 94% occupied primarily by high-tech companies. So that's just a great story of revitalization. It even has a three and a half acre rooftop up there and with a jogging track. So it's the country's largest rooftop. So not only does that revitalize that building and bring life back to the building, but it also revitalizes the neighborhood around it, brings life to that neighborhood. I'm gonna spend the next few minutes just giving you a real quick rundown of the history of Chicago. In the mid-1600s, around 1640, King Louis XIV got a group of people together, led by Louis Joliet and John East Marquette, to come and explore how they knew somehow the Atlantic Ocean connecting to the Great Lakes was somehow be able to connect to the Mississippi River. So they sent a group of men out to explore. Upon that exploration, they come across the Native Americans that lived here, and they showed them how the Chicago River would help them do that with a bit of cordage. Anyway, the river, when discovered, was about four feet wide, two feet deep. So it was just a trickle. The land was covered with a weed called Chicago Wa. It kind of had an onion garlic smell to it. Okay, and Chicago Wa is where the name Chicago comes from. So some say New York got the big apple and Chicago got the smelly onion. But anyway. John Baptiste de Salvo, though, 1780, an, uh, an escaped slave from Haiti, they claim, he gets credit for coming here and being the first settler and dis actually discovering Chicago. 1833, we became a town with 400 people. 1837, a city with 4,000 people. 1871, there was over a million people in the city of Chicago. So we grew really rapidly. That meant we had to build rapidly to keep up with the growth of the population. The most readily available material was wood, harvested out of Michigan and Wisconsin. This whole downtown over here was all wooden structures. Even some of the sidewalks and streets were wooden, right? Summer of 1871 was a very dry summer. October the 8th, 1871, over here just a little ways to the west, a lady named Mrs. O'Leary lived over there and she had a barn. The legend is the cow kicked over the barn one, or kicked over the lantern in the barn and set it on fire. Okay, nobody knows that the cow did it, but they know the fire started in Mrs. O'Leary's barn. Because it was dry, because it was windy, and because the fire department went to the wrong address, that fire spread. This river was narrow, it was polluted, and the fire was able to jump the river and land in the downtown. It set the downtown on fire. Three and a half square miles of the city burned and turned into ash. 300 people dead, 17,000 struck. They have spires, and the spire counts into the height of the building. One World Trade Center, the spire is about 430 some feet of that 700 or 1776 feet height that they get to claim. Sears Tower is from the floor to the rooftop. Those two white structures up there are antennas. Antennas don't get the count, even though those antennas are about 280 feet high each. Oh, that's just a hypertextual thing. I don't know why. Not fair. Anyway, the Sears Tower, it's actually a collection of nine buildings sitting on the city block, three by three. This is called bundling. That's how they stabilize the main tower of the building. You put various towers surrounding it at various heights. If you go up, if you see on the 103rd floor up there, that's where those little boxes, those things on the left-hand side of the building are hanging over. That's called the ledge. That's the observation deck, okay? 
Those were added in recent years. But anyway, they're glass boxes that are retractable. They push out, okay, about four feet. They pull them into washing, then they push them back out. But that allows you to go up there and walk out onto an inch and a half thick piece of glass and look down 1,300 feet. Okay, so if you want a little thrill in your life, that's the way to get it. Okay, and that's the sky deck at the Sears Tower. From up there, you can see Illinois, Indiana, Wisconsin, and uh, Michigan, okay, on a clear day like today. So a really cool experience up there. Now, here's a bob tip of the day for you. If you just want to go get a great view from a high floor atop of a tall building, John Hancock Building on North Michigan Avenue, the Signature Room. Just go up there and have a drink. You don't have to spend the 50 bucks to go to the top of the Sears Tower, but it's worth the ride. And if you're on the City Pass that you may have used to get on the boat here, that is one of your options. So check it out. Also, they redid the block, the base of that building. So that's cool. There's a food court down there and some shops and things. So Sears Tower is still definitely worth the tour. But otherwise, just go to the John Hancock building, and I'll show you where it is later in the tour. Now, you keep hearing me say Sears. There are about six people in the world, maybe one of you are on here, that called that studio in there when it opened was a million bucks. They just sold the hotel portion to a new owner, and it's now said that each hotel room cost four hundred thousand dollars. Isn't that crazy? That's why I don't think you can touch a hotel in there for under seven eight hundred dollars a night. But anyway, absolutely gorgeous structure. Over here on your on your right, folks, see these. Of these um, kayaks again they're a fun thing to do but I want you to pay attention to the color of those kayaks and here's why Saturday before st. Patrick's Day it's tradition we dye this river green the entire river from here all the way down to Wolf Point and it's that color green when it's all said and done okay it's a very bright neon green and it lasts about a week as the week goes on the color starts to dissipate they use a chemical I forget what it's called. It's very organic. It's very safe. They, it's the same chemical they use when they suspicion somebody might be dumping into the river. So anyway, a fun tradition if you like to come out and be fun. Thing. There's actually two more parcels of land for building. There's a small parcel over there, and then this one that you can actually see. There's supposed to be two more towers, residential towers, go up here. But beyond that, look at that Kirby building with the circle at the top. Some people say that building looks like a flask. Okay? This is the Lake Point Tower building. It's famous and known, not a port, not only is it a gorgeous building, it has awesome views, but Daniel Burnham said no building on the lakefront. Well, this building, through some loopholes that, they, that some shrewd people found in the zoning code, managed to get that building built in the 60s. And so that building got built out on the lakefront when nothing else was supposed to. Um, and it will be the last building built there. Putting in gorgeous views up there. A lot of celebrities, Holly Berry, Sammy Sosa, just to name a couple of things will live there. We're passing under the one and only Lakeshore Drive, known as the Sabo Lakeshore Drive Man, which follows the lakeshore on the lakefront. We have 28 miles of lakefront here in the city of Chicago. There's 18 miles of bike and footpath here, too. So if you want to go out for a run in the morning or just ride a dinghy bike and go for a ride, you can do 18 miles and it ends with 36 miles round trip. Off to your left over here, Daniel Burnham had vision of multiple piers to be built. This is the one that did. This is Navy Pier. It was completed in 1916. And it's called Navy Pier because it was built for the Navy. It served as barracks, training facilities. It even had a landing strip on it to practice landing on aircraft carriers. I'm told there's 200 airplanes at the bottom of the lake. So I guess not everybody hit their target. George Bush Sr. did his pilot training on here or some of it as well. It sat empty for a while. It was used as a college for a while. Now it is our largest cultural center. Folks, there's lots of stuff to go out there and do, especially for the kids, okay? So lots of different shops, lots of different food. There's the Ferris wheel, which represents, is a replica, not the full size, but a replica of the original Ferris wheel that they viewed at the World's Fair. Now, those of you without children, did you just pick up what I told you? There's lots of children out there. <laughs> 
No, it's a good time. Go out to the end of the, the very end of the pier, break the news of the lake. You can even do the uh, um, shoreline uh, lifeboat cruise from Folks, here's what we're going to do. We're going to turn the boat and pause for a couple moments so that you can take some pictures of that skyline. All right? You'll be able to see the south loop down there. That's where the museum campus is. This channel is supported by you. So hit that subscribe button, like this video, and let us know your thoughts in the comments below. Stay tuned for more adventures.